about because you you talk about in the book Web three, and that's right. you know a buzzword which you know always needs clarification sure. whenever it's invoked. And you're talking about it now. How is you know how when you talk about Web three and what about this alternative position? Um, yeah, what sure. what is it? And then I want to talk about identity stacks as sure. opposed to kind Fine. of technical stacks. So there's yeah. different ways of talking about Web three. One of them there's an illustration which is Web one is mm-hmm. Log in with username and password, type it in. Right. Web two is you click and you log in with Facebook or Twitter or what have you. Web mm-hmm. three is you're logging in with your private key or your Ethereum wallet or what have you. And right. the difference is that um, that combines certain aspects of web one and web two. Uh, you have the um, local password and the local credentials and so on, okay? Mm-hmm. But you're logging into a global service. Um, Another way of thinking about Web One versus Web Two versus Web Three, I've talked about this, you know, at, at some length, is, you know, Web One and also really the early internet was genuinely peer to peer. Okay, client and server were basically equal. You could send email back and forth, etc. Okay, um, and it was open source and programmable and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Then with Web Two Point um, this is a little bit of a retcon because at the time Web Two Point was thought of as a front end thing, but let's talk about the back end. Web Two Point you had the rise of Facebook and Twitter and Dropbox and these centralized services where, see, the thing is, um, every time you refresh Facebook or Twitter, if you had to send your entire profile information and everything you did to somebody else, mm-hmm. that'd be very redundant. So instead, both of you connect to a hub and you pull the information right. from there. And so then you just sell, yeah. send small updates, right? That hub is very efficient and it gives you so-called global states. So all these nodes have something global yeah. they can write to. But it's also a place where you can make huge profits because you can serve the ads right. there and so on and so forth. So right. this is basically the back end architecture of the last twenty years. Right. Web three takes the best in my and view. If, if I may, just yes. on the on the front end of that though, what what web two or or social media or user generated content, something like Facebook allows you your content conceivably or YouTube is maybe a better example to be seen by lots of people. Yes, but it's no longer peer to peer because you're going to. Yes, an YouTube intermediary who is then distributing it. And then also, you know, they can serve yeah, ads control. against it. They can also censor it, et cetera. That's right. That's uh, right. But validate it and verify it in, in, That's a, right. in a positive way. It's not all negative. That's right. That's right. So the Web3 version is that central hub and spoke, the hub of the hub and spoke, is now replaced by a decentralized database. And many of them, there's different, you know, there's Ethereum and, yeah. and, and so on, right? And Bitcoin, whatever. Um, and that decentralized database has aspects of both Web 1 and Web 2. Why? It is open source, it's programmable, and it's transparent and so on like mm-hmm. Web 1. But it also has that central hub, which actually allows for a great deal of profit. It, ha- it offers global state. There's a global mm-hmm. database that's now available. Um, but yet it's also peer-to-peer. And that right. is really what a blockchain is. It's a data structure that combine that basically is... a Anybody is a root user of a blockchain. That's a fundamental new thing of a blockchain. It's a massively multi-user database, right? Where any user is a root user. Whereas, um, for example, for Twitter or Facebook, the password to Twitter or Facebook's database is not on the internet, right? With uh, with a blockchain, you everybody can read every row that's in the Bitcoin or Ethereum database. It's public on, on the internet. That's a fundamental difference, right? It's not open source, it's open state. Now, I know that might sound technical, but it's a, just a true shift in what the back end architecture of a system is. It can belong to all the folks who run the nodes or run the stakers or run the miners and so on in that community. And they can, by mutual consent amongst themselves, host whatever content they want. And uh, the development of these blockchains creates huge amounts of money, okay, which is important because it funds the whole thing. So now you have a model which combines some of the good aspects of Web 1 and the good aspects of Web 2, and that's Web 3. And this, by the way, is something I think about a great deal. It's like the helical theory of history where you sort of wind upwards, you know? It's cyclical, X of T equals cos of T and Y of T equals sine T on on one plane, but Z of T equals T, and so you have a parametric curve that kind of spirals upwards. Cyclical in some ways, progressive in other ways, right? And so, for example, you have gold, then you have fiat currency, and then you have Bitcoin. Or you have the you know paper document, and then you have a scanner, and then you have uh, the fully digital document, right? right. And um, I think one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, you have the city state, 
And then you have the roll up of a bunch of city states into a nation state where all these independent little principalities get rolled up into one big thing that has a huge amount of scale. That's why just like gold was sort of defeated by fiat currency, the city state was defeated by the nation state. And so then the V3 is, in my view, the network state, which combines some of the scalability and defensibility uh, of the, the nation state with the agility uh, and independence of the city state, right? So like the V3. This is like a common theme in a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. About. 